Back in the year 793, there was no country called England. Instead, in this, uh, the country that we now know as England was made up of separate Anglo-Saxon kingdoms, Northumbria, Mercia, East Anglia and Wessex, and sometimes one of those kingdoms would have a dominant role. Most recently, it had been the Midland Kingdom of Mercia, under their king, Offa. But in 793, all of that was about to change. On the 8th of June, 793, the monks at the historic monastery of Lindisfarne off the Northumbrian coast looked at the eastern horizon, and there coming towards them was a fleet of ships. They and the rest of England were about to come face to face with the violent raiders from Scandinavia, the Vikings. These Viking raiders were to blow Anglo-Saxon England apart and bring it to its knees, and, and it came within a whisker that there was never going to be an England. In fact, there might have been a Daneland rather than an England, except for one man who stood in their way. This is the story of Alfred the Great and the Vikings. But before we go any further, what I'd like to do is clear up a few popular misconceptions about the people that are referred to as the Vikings. First off, we tend to talk about the Vikings as some sort of coherent racial group. And they weren't. They came from Scandinavia, it's true, but they were not part of some united political or cultural offensive. You know, and they were variously referred to uh, by the Anglo-Saxons as Danes, Northmen, it tended to be Norwegians, Pagans or Heathen. And it was only later historians that gave them the sort of collective name of Vikings. The term Viking actually comes from the old Scandinavian word meaning to raid or pirate. So in other words, Vikings is not a descriptor, it's a verb. People from Scandinavia went Viking, they went raiding. So <laughs> piracy, as much as conquest, was their whole raison d'etre, you know, be it for treasure or livestock or slaves. And it was only later on that they started to think about actually owning the land that they were visiting. Second uh, myth that I want to pop is that they were, that they were not on some sort of anti-Christian crusade or anti-Christian campaign. You know, stand in their shoes. They are raiders. They're pirates. And they like booty. And you suddenly see the, these wealthy monasteries full of gold crosses and all this wealth, totally unprotected, on remote islands and headlands. Why wouldn't you raid them? And, and if a monk was stupid enough to stop you taking the gold cross off the altar, well, then he gets what he deserves. So, you know, they followed up their raid on Lindisfarne with an attack on the, the monastery at Jarrow, the home of the now dead Bede, who wrote the ecclesi ecclesiastical history of the English people. And then he sailed around, they sailed around the west coast of Scotland to the monastery of Iona, founded by St. Columba, who we've talked about in the past. Iona was raided three times in quick succession. And by the time the Vikings arrived for the fourth time, they found the monks had up sticks and moved to Ireland. Opportunistic raids were one thing, but in 865, everything changed. In that year, a huge fleet containing over 3,000 warriors landed in East Anglia, commanded by Ivor the Boneless, a son of the legendary Viking warrior Ragnar Lothbrok. The Anglo-Saxons had never faced an army like this before and they called it the Great Heathen Army. How would the East Anglian king defeat such a big army on his doorstep? Well, he chose not to. Instead, he offered to pay them some money to leave him alone. And remember what I said about the Vikings earlier, they were there for the loot. So they accepted the king's offer. And this started a long tradition in England of kings paying a Danegeld to buy peace with the, with the Norse and the, the Danes. But apart from gold and silver, Ivor the Boneless insisted on an additional tribute from the King of East Anglia, horses. Now, what would a bunch, admittedly a very large bunch, of seafaring Vikings want with horses? Well, they were suddenly transformed into a mounted army. Now they could ride around England, irrespective of whether there was a large river nearby or not. And the following year, 866, they struck. They rode up from East Anglia through the eastern side of Mercia, who gave them a clear access. Well, after all, why would you annoy a 3,000 strong Viking army if you didn't need to? And they entered Northumbria. Unfortunately for Northumbria, 
They were going through a bit of a dynastic dispute at that moment, and there were two rival kings at each other's throats. Remember how the, the Vikings liked undefended monasteries? Well, weak undefended kingdoms were good too. So they stormed York and captured the northern city on the 1st of November, 866. The squabbling Northumbrians uh, claimants then agreed to put their differences aside and they marched on York. And in the ensuing battle, both claimants were killed and Ivor the Boneless was victorious. He then proceeded to place a puppet king on the throne of Northumbria. And Northumbria would never again be a serious player in Anglo-Saxon England. And now the great heathen army turned their attention to Mercia. And in the autumn of 867, the Vikings uh, came up the River Trent on their boats and they captured Nottingham. Let's quickly pause in our story and look at the two kingdoms of Mercia and Wessex. Mercia's heyday under their King Offa had passed. And as the 9th century, the 800s, progressed, the balance of power started to drift towards the southern kingdom of Wessex under their king, Egbert. Egbert was succeeded by his son, Aethelwulf. Aethelwulf was blessed with five sons, which was just as well with those Vikings kecking around. With the security of more than enough sons, Aethelwulf decided to go on a pilgrimage to Rome, leaving his kingdom in the custody of two of his sons, Aethelbald, who had ruled the ancient heartlands of Wessex on his behalf, and Aethelbert, who took on the management of the, the, the uh, client kingdom of Kent. In 855, King Aethelwulf of Wessex set off for Rome, accompanied by his wife, the Lady Osberth, and according to later accounts, his youngest son, Alfred. Having spent nearly a year in the Holy City, the, the, the royal family started their return journey in 856, minus the Lady Osberth, who had died. Travelling through Francia, modern-day France, they spent time at the, uh, the court of Charles the Bald, a successor of Charlemagne. And it was here that the 50-year-old Aethelwulf decided to remarry. And the lucky lady? None other than the daughter of the Frankish ruler himself, Princess Judith, aged 12. The king returned to Wessex to find that Aethelbald had risen in rebellion and refused to give back Wessex, which he'd been managing on his father's behalf. And rather than risk a dynastic civil war, the old king agreed to split the kingdom between his son, ruling Wessex, and he himself took over Kent. Two years later, Aethelwulf died, and Aethelbald not only took over the whole kingdom, but he married his dad's 14-year-old widow. And before this Jerry Springer show could get totally out of hand, he then died of unknown causes two years later, and Judith moved on to husband number three, the Count of Flanders, and she was just 16. Their direct descendant, Matilda of Flanders, was to marry William of Normandy, aka William the Conqueror, and so our current Queen, Queen Elizabeth II of, of, of Great Britain, is a long-lost descendant of sexy Judith. It was just as well that old King Aethelwulf and Lady Osberth had had so many sons, because they had a knack of dying. The oldest son was already dead before their pilgrimage to Rome, and brothers two and three had inherited the crown only to die childless within five years of each other, and was succeeded by brother number four, Aethelred, in 865. Just in time to meet the great heathen army. And now the great heathen army turned their attention to Mercia, and in, August, in the autumn of 867, the Vikings struck from Northumbria and attacked and captured the town of Nottingham. The King of Mercia appealed to his brother-in-law, Aethelfred, King of Wessex, for assistance, and Wessex responded. Together, the armies of Mercia and Wessex converged on Nottingham. And accompanying, accompanying Aethelfred, was his younger brother, Alfred, Prince of Wessex. And when they reached Nottingham, the King of Mercia paid the Vikings to go home, another Danegeld. So with one kingdom conquered, Northumbria, and a pile of booty from another one, the great heathen army now headed off to East Anglia. And this time, however, the King of East Anglia, Edmund, decided he was going to fight. The result was never really in doubt. 
the army of East Anglia were routed and Edmund was killed. Now, some accounts say that he died in battle, and others say that he was tied to a tree and shot with arrows. Either way, he became venerated as a Christian martyr, Saint Edmund the Martyr. I've actually got a video all about him on my YouTube channel, so check it out. Not now, not now, later. Ivor the Bonus was enjoying himself so much that he decided now to go north and plunder the Brethonic kingdom of Strathclyde. And then he went on to Ireland, where he died in 872. Meanwhile, some of the great heathen army, under another leader called Guthrum, had stayed in Cambridge in East Anglia. And they decided it was time to pay a visit to the last kingdom standing, Wessex. They seized London, and then they moved up the River Thames to Reading. On the 4th of January, 871, King Ethelred and Prince Alfred arrived at the Berkshire town, Reading, with their army. The battle took place just outside the fortified town, and just when it looked like the men of Wessex were winning, the gates of Reading were thrown open and another horde of Vikings descended upon them from effectively from behind. The two brothers managed to withdraw their somewhat depleted army away from Reading. Four days later, the emboldened Vikings now sallied forth and prepared to finish uh, the, the, Wessex, the army of Wessex off at nearby Ashdown. But this time, however, it was the brothers' turn to triumph. The Battle of Ashdown was the first time that the great heathen army had been defeated. And it is rightly remembered as a battle that saved Wessex from following the fates of Northumbria and East Anglia. Within a few months of this victory, Wessex had another nasty shock. King Aethelred died and he left two infant sons to inherit the throne. But this was really not a time that you wanted two infants on the throne of Wessex when you had the great heathen army just up the road. And so it was that his brother, Alfred, was elected by the great nobles of Wessex, the Witan, as their king. Alfred is the Anglo-Saxon king that we actually know most about. And that's principally because his friend Asa, Bishop of Sherborne, wrote a biography uh, about him with incidentally a lot of input from Alfred himself. So not a very, uh, uh, it's a pretty biased biography. What Asa doesn't spend much time on is med Alfred's medical afflictions. Throughout his adult, adult life, um, Alfred suffered from serious bouts of hemorrhoids and he certainly shows signs, symptoms, uh, modern, if you were looking modern day, uh, symptoms of Crohn's disease. For a medieval king who was expected to basically be in the saddle leading troops into battle or touring his realm, having hemorrhoids must have been really uncomfortable to say the least. And likewise, you know, the constant stress of dealing with Viking invasions, some of which, as we will see, were really serious, uh, is not a really good anti an uh, an antidote for Crohn's disease. Three years prior to becoming king, Alfred had married a Mercian noblewoman, uh, Aylswith, the Lady Aylswith, whose mother was descended from the Mer Mercian royal dynasty. And by now she'd already provided Alfred with a daughter and in time would give birth to two sons and two further daughters. The Anglo-Saxon Chronicle records that Alfred now paid the Vikings to leave Reading and Wessex, which they duly did, along with their newly acquired Danegeld. And Alfred was able to breathe a little bit more freely for the next four years. Meanwhile, Mercia certainly wasn't breathing free, more freely. In 873, the Vikings once more sailed up the River Trent, this time to the Royal Burial Monastery at Repton, which they proceeded to occupy. Psychologically, this is like a foreign army turning up in, in, in Britain and taking over Windsor Castle, or a foreign army going to the United States and taking over uh, Arlington National Cemetery. The King of Mercia had had enough, and he fled to Rome, and the Viking leader, Halfdan, who was uh, another son of Ragnar Lothbrok, placed a puppet king on the throne of Mercia. And now only one great Anglo-Saxon kingdom was left. Wessex was the last kingdom. And in 875, the storm broke. The Viking leader in East Anglia, remember a man called Guthrum? He launched a two-pronged attack on Wessex. Leaving Cambridge with a mounted army, he managed to travel undetected 200 miles through the forests of Wessex. Remember, England in those days was covered by forests. It's not like now with the, the, you know, the rolling countryside and lovely fields. Principally, England was forested and he was able to actually travel undetected 200 miles through the forests of Wessex. 
and seized the royal town of Wareham in Dorset. And at the same time, his second prong of his attack, a fleet of 120 ships, sailed round the coast, southern coast and met him there at Wareham. Alfred rushed to Wareham to find Guthrum sitting behind the walls. They agreed peace terms. And then under the cover of darkness, Guthrum led a wild cavalry charge out of the town through the Anglo-Saxon lines and rode off into the night. Next stop, Exeter in Devon. Once again, Alfred had to hurry after him and once again he found Guthrum holed up in one of his own fortified towns. After his two year tour around Wessex, Guthrum agreed to leave at a price and went just over the border, not back to East Anglia, but just into Mercia. And there he waited and Guthrum didn't have to wait long. Feasting was a major part of the Anglo-Saxon social life. It was the glue that bonded society together, no more so than between the king and his nobles. And in the Anglo-Saxon culture, the 12 days of Christmas was not just a Christmas song. It was the party of the year, 12 straight days of feasting. And Christmas Tide 877-78 was no exception. Alfred and his court moved to the Royal Manor at Chippenham in Wiltshire for the festivities. And you can just imagine just how much feasting and drinking there must have been. By the twelfth night, the last night of the celebration, the food and the drink and the food must have taken its toll on even the hardiest of warriors and party goers. Have you ever woken up at the morning after a really good party? Come on, I know you have. And your head might be throbbing a bit. You're certainly feeling a bit jaded after 12 days worth of partying. Well, on the 6th of January, 878, the Royal Court at Chippenham was waking up to one of those mornings. And then out of the mists, with a roar, came Guthrum's army. The Royal Manor at Chippenham was stormed. Vikings killing, shrieks of women, children, People running everywhere, the confusion, and in this confusion, somewhere was the King of Wessex trapped in his own party palace. Guthrum's attack was a masterstroke, except for one thing. In the terror and confusion, somehow Alfred managed to get away, and riding with a small band of supporters as fast as he could, he went westwards, away from Guthrum's army, who were set off in pursuit. Westwards they went until they reached the great marshlands of Somerset. These have now been drained and are called the Somerset Levels. But back in 878, this whole area was a dense swamp of reeds and waterways, which were inaccessible except to locals with local knowledge. And it was here, in the bleak, isolated marshes of Somerset, that Alfred sought refuge. It was also here that the legend claims that whilst living incognito, Alfred was left in charge of some loaves in an oven and was scolded by the wife of a swineherdsman for burning them. And meanwhile, Guthrum was ravaging, ravaging Wiltshire. Wessex was his for the taking. Who could seriously stop him? Alfred's father had had five sons. Four of them were now dead. His brother had two infant sons. Alfred himself only had an infant daughter, hardly in a position to fight back. There was only one man who could save Wessex and indeed the future of Anglo-Saxon England. And so Alfred sent out messages, summoning the firths of Somerset and Dorset and Wiltshire to meet him. Whitsun is the Christian festival that marks Pentecost. It's the, the moment in the Christian Bible where God's Holy Spirit descended like fire on the disciples as they, as they hid from the Roman authorities. Uh, in Jerusalem after the crucifixion at Easter. And suddenly at Whitsun, they came out and they started to preach fearlessly. And so it was at Whitsun in 878 that Alfred, like the disciples, came out of hiding to reclaim his kingdom. And as he moved eastwards towards the Selwood Forest, where the counties of Somerset, Dorset and Wilt Wiltshire all meet, word started to spread. The king was alive and he was preparing to fight. And at a spot called Egbert's Stone, which is probably somewhere just south of Warminster, he met the thirds of the three counties and their eldermen. And then they turned north and marched towards Guthrum's army. Just southeast of Trowbridge uh, is a place called Eddington. And that's where the two armies met and formed their fearsome shield wards. 
The Battle of Eddington was bloody, it was vicious, and eventually the Vikings broke. Alfred's men pursued them 20 full miles back to Chippenham, and there Guthrum sued for peace. And Alfred agreed with one condition. Guthrum and his leading men were to be baptised as Christians. And Guthrum agreed, and with Alfred acting as his godfather, he was then allowed to retreat back to East Anglia. Alfred and Guthrum then concluded a peace treaty which demarcated the Anglo-Saxon and the Danish spheres of control. To the west was Alfred's kingdom and half of the once mighty Mercia. To the east was Viking territory, which would eventually be called the Danelaw. True to his word, Guthrum never attacked Wessex again. The puppet King of Mercia, who had been placed on the throne by, the, uh, by, by Havdan, uh, disappears at this stage. And a regent named Ethelred took control of the Western, the, Anglo, the Anglo-Saxon half. Once mighty Mercia had been reduced to a rump state with a regent or elderman instead of a king. Everyone knew who was really in charge. Alfred of Wessex. To appease Mercian feelings, Alfred asked Ethelred to administer London. He also married his eldest daughter to the regent Ethelred. Her name was Ethel Flayd, and she has a story all of her own, which I'll tell you on another occasion. And rather like Offa of Mercia a century beforehand, Alfred started styling himself Rex Anglorum, King of the English. It was now that Alfred starts to, uh, started to organise a fortified burrs or boroughs across his country. I mean, it wasn't an original idea. Some were, were Roman walled towns that had been reoccupied and refurbished. Uh, other burrs had been set up by previous kings of Wessex. But Alfred's innovation was to make them military strong points rather than just places of refuge for civilians to cower behind. And he introduced garrisons into those burrs whose purpose was to hold the burr until the main army arrived. But all good things come to an end. And in 891, Guthrum died. And with him died the peace. Within a year, a huge Viking fleet that had been laying siege to Paris turned its attention to England. 250 ships landed at a place called Appledore in Kent, which is just to the east of Tenterton nowadays. Uh, while another 80 landed in the north of Kent, uh, near Sittingbourne. So we had two armies in the north and the south of Kent. But they were unable to break into any of the burrs. And by the time Alfred's army arrived, there was just a, a standoff. And then a third fleet of 100 ships suddenly arrived. This was made up of adventurers from Northumbria and East Anglia, who obviously got sick and tired of, I don't know, farming or whatever they were doing there. And this fleet sailed along the south coast of England and attacked Exeter. Remember, Guthrum had been there in the past. But once again, unlike Guthrum, they were unable to break into the fortified town the Burr held. Alfred raised an army and went down there to deal with, with, the, guy, uh, with the invaders in, in Exeter, and he left Kent in the hands of his young son, Edward. Meanwhile, the Vikings in Appledore in South Kent used this opportunity to slip through the forests of the Weald of Kent and strike out westwards into Wessex. Edward raced after them, and at Farnham in Hampshire, he destroyed their army. There now followed one of those famous negotiations between the Anglo-Saxons and the Sittingbourne Vikings, the ones in North Kent, who were st still entrenched, going nowhere. And once again, a Dane Geld was agreed. And with their booty, they jumped on their, war their warships and they sailed off. Well straight across the Thames to the other side of the Thames, where they decamped at Benfleet in Essex, which was now part of Danish-controlled East Anglia. So technically they'd left Wessex and Mercia, but make no, doubt, make no bones about it, um, everyone knew that they were still very much a clear and present danger. And so Edward and his brother-in-law, Athelred of Mercia, decided to take the water at Benfleet, and they destroyed the fleet at Benfleet. It was the last Viking challenge that Alfred faced. Three great fleets had not captured a single burr, nor had they won any major battles. And apart from a Dane girl to pay to the Sittingbourne Vikings, they'd come away, the Vikings had come away with very little to show for their efforts. What a turnaround from the early days of his reign. Alfred the Great died in 899, having been King of Wessex for 28 years. 
He is the only King of England to have ever been given the title the Great. But was Alfred really that great? I mean, he only dominated the south and west of what would become England. He was not the King of England. And there were probably as many Anglo-Saxons living under Danish rule on the eastern side uh, of Danelaw as there were under Alfred's. Mercia was still technically independent of Wessex. I mean, really, Alfred was King of Wessex, well, and Kent and Sussex. Alfred was the Winston Churchill of his age. I don't remember, there was a public poll by the BBC um, in the early 2000s and Churchill was voted the greatest of Britain for saving Britain from Nazi tyranny. Alfred was the last man standing in the way of Scandinavian domination of England and indeed therefore I think of the rest of Britain. His own royal palace had been captured. He was a fugitive hiding in the marshes of Somerset and then he'd rallied, he'd fought back and then he'd secured his kingdom against further attacks. And if Winston Churchill can be voted the greatest Briton, then for all those achievements, I think Alfred probably deserves his accolade of being the great. But his work and ambition to form one single kingdom of the Anglo-Saxons, England, would need to be completed by those who are coming after him. Right, to hear more stories in the future.